Hello everyone. In this video lecture, I'm going to go over some background information regarding H.G. Wells and the text that you have to begin reading for this week, his novella, The Island of Dr. Moreau. <clears throat> in brief, this class is going to consist of a reflection on his background, his history, and his personal philosophy, a summary of the text, and then in the next set of video lectures, we'll delve into an analysis of the work. H.G. Wells was born in 1866 to a low-income family and faced, in part as a result of that fact, a series of challenges throughout his childhood. One of the most significant events of his young life was that in 1874, he suffered a broken leg that left him largely confined to his bed. While he was there, he spent much of his time reading books, consuming texts that had been brought to him by his father. These books stimulated in him, they provoked in him, a desire to write and to explore the imaginative fantasy worlds that he encountered. By 1887, he had moved into a manor house alongside his mother. Inside this house, there was a resplendent and extensive library into which he became immersed. And he supplemented his understanding or his familiarity with more contemporary texts with an appreciation of classic works of philosophy and of political theory, such as Plato's Republic, and Thomas More's Utopia. Wells' exploration of literature, politics, and philosophy at this young age would then help to shape the author that he became. The text that you're going to be reading for this section of the course is heavily immersed in issues of the political organization of society and the proper political organization of society based on worldview. So how do we structure our societies based on the fact that to Wells, who was a strident atheist, we are nothing more than highly evolved animals. That kind of question about how society evolves and how it is structured based on animalistic evolutionary instincts is a key component of this text. In 1879, Wells entered into a position as a student teacher. So he took on the role of instructing younger students. And through his work and through his education, he won a scholarship to what would become the Royal College of Science in Kensington. There, he studied biology under the famed Thomas Henry Huxley, who is widely known or was widely known at that time as Darwin's Bulldog. Huxley engaged in numerous debates with opponents of Darwin's theory of evolution. Wells' understanding of the world, his appreciation of the, the scientific understanding of the world that he attempted to articulate as within his works, was very much shaped by his time spent under Huxley. And we'll see how those uh, evolutionary biological underpinnings and his familiarity with biology comes through in this text as we continue to read it. Wells himself was, by philosophy and inclination, a strident atheist, atheist and materialist. Now, an atheist is someone who believes that there is no God, and a materialist is someone who believes that there is a nothing in this universe but matter. So everything in this universe consists of matter. There is no spirit. There is no uh, sort of ephemeral force of any kind. Human beings think because we have these few pounds of fleshly matter inside of our brains. The brain and the mind are indistinguishable, or the brain and the electrochemical processes therein are responsible for producing the mind. There is no objective reality to certain things like um, the categorization systems that we use. They don't exist outside of ourselves. They are merely things that we impose upon the world. Now, Wells himself is considered to be one of the great fathers of classic science fiction that, who helped to popularize and develop the genre. After graduating with a Bachelor's of Science degree in zoology in 1890, he then began to find work as a teacher. Several years after this, during which he was producing short pieces analytical works, nonfiction texts, and short stories, he eventually published his first novel, The Time Machine, in 1895, which led him down one of the most successful literary careers in the field of science fiction that we have ever seen. Now, shortly thereafter, Wells published his 1896 novella, The Island of Dr. Moreau. In the first nine chapters of this text, we meet with Prendick. Prendick is a gentleman from England who is traveling aboard the Lady Vane. Well, on his journey, the Lady Vane collides with a derelict, and he and two other survivors escape on a lifeboat or on a dinghy. 
these two men, eventually driven to madness and desperation, turn on each other. The narrator, Prendrick, says that they grappled with each other and then fell overboard, fell off the dinghy and drowned. Eventually, at the verge of death, in the throes of starvation and desperation, Prendrick is found by a passing ship. That ship is carrying a man named Montgomery, who is transporting a series of animals to the island of Dr. Moreau, or what we will come to know is the island of Dr. Moreau, uh, on the orders of his employer, the titular character, Dr. Moreau. Montgomery saves Prendrick, brings him on board the ship, and then nurses him back to health. He is then taken to the island of Dr. Moreau. Well on the ship, as he is recovering, Prendrick encounters the strange black servant of Montgomery, who has a bizarre almost fire or red flame to his eyes and a sloping brow. There's something bizarre and slightly inhuman about this person that he keeps encountering. It, it is slavishly devoted to Montgomery. Dr. Moreau himself was driven from England under mysterious circumstances. Now, the narrator, Prendrick, eventually recalls that Dr. Moreau was a famed vivisectionist, and we'll talk about what vivisection is in just a moment, but the experiments that he carried out and the techniques that he used in his research were so abhorrent when the public was made aware of them that he was forced to flee the country in shame as an outcast. Eventually, Prendrick reaches the island of Dr. Moreau, and after nearly being set adrift again, because Dr. Moreau refused to allow him onto the island for reasons that are unknown, he enters onto the island, he is granted access, Dr. Moreau will not allow him to perish on the seas. He is brought back to the island, where he continues his convalescence and recovery, and yet he is plagued at all times by the hideous screaming of the puma that was being transported, one of the many animals that was being transported on the ship that rescued him. Now, Dr. Moreau himself is a vivisectionist. We learn what this is in the context of the novel, but just as a review, vivisection is essentially the dissection of living animals, where we would cut open an animal, splay open its uh, interior workings in order to examine them. In the same way that dissection allows us to understand the organelles, the functions, and the organization of a dead creature, vivisection does the same only with a living creature, which is very much more uh, relevant and germane, helpful to an understanding or gaining an understanding of one of these creatures because you can see the systems at work within it while the creature is still alive, while they are actually still at work. Rather than looking at dead capillaries and muscle tissues that aren't firing, in vivisection you can examine <clears throat> the structures of this creature's body as they function. Vivisection had by Wells' time become tightly controlled and monitored. However, in the time that H.G. Wells is discussing in the novel, so when Dr. Moreau was carrying out his experiments, vivisection was a hotly debated topic among the public, and there were a series of different arguments going on about the legitimacy of this as a practice. There were a number of anti-vivisection campaigns that arose as a result of the fact that you are splaying open, you are cutting open a living animal that is completely sensate to pain. 